Hello, America, and hello, Alaska. Welcome to STAND, where we learn from inspiring people who are standing boldly for their convictions and ideas on how we can improve our communities, our cities, and our country. I'm Kelly Chewbacca. I'm joined with my husband and co-host, Nikki Chewbacca. I cannot wait to introduce you to our fantastic guest, but first, Remember to join our community of standouts by subscribing to our show at The Stand Show on YouTube. That's at The Stand Show on YouTube. You can also find us on our website, standshow.org, or follow us on social media, Kelly for Alaska. Remember to invite your friends too. The greater impact we have will be when we stand together. And now let me introduce you to our fantastic guest for the day. Today we have Larry Elder also known as The Sage from South Central. He's a New York Times bestselling author, award-winning documentary filmmaker, and one of the best-known media figures in America today. His flagship daily radio program, The The Larry Elder Show, was heard every weekday in all 50 states, including here in the last frontier of Alaska, and on more than 300 stations. In 2021, Larry ran a nationally renowned, bold, and inspiring campaign for governor of California in the recall effort against Governor Gavin Newsom. He took a common sense and courageous stand for policies that promoted sensible law enforcement rather than proliferating crime and booming housing rather than the ballooning homelessness that we're seeing. And today, Larry is taking a bold stand again. He is running for president of the United States. He's also written a book entitled As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save the Nation. And Larry, we totally love the picture on the cover of your book. It's the best. So we're truly honored to have Larry Elder on our show today to talk about his presidential run. And I want to emphasize this. If you want to support Larry, you can go to LarryElder.com. That's LarryElder.com. Larry, welcome to Stand. The more people hear your message, I think the more momentum you're going to gain. Speaking of people hearing your message, our oldest daughter is in college right now. And I was telling her last night, she she's up at odd hours. So she was calling us at around 11 o'clock and she was talking about stuff in college. And I said, well, you know, we're going to be talking to Larry Elder tomorrow. And she said, the Larry Elder? I said, <laughs> I said yes, Larry Elder. She said, the Larry Elder? I said, yes. And she's like, I'm so jealous. And the reason I share that with you, Larry, is I think... What struck me about that is that your voice is having a a generational Mm -hmm. impact. And so to hear a younger generation, right, she's 19 years old, saying that she's been impacted and influenced by and inspired by the stands that you've taken, by the Mm -hmm. policy uh, prescriptions that you've put out there, I think says a lot. And so just wanted to encourage you with that, that the people who are listening it's across generations that that you're impacting. Well, you know, Nikki, that is, that is so flattering. I, I've been on radio and TV for almost 40 years. I've had a column since uh, April of 1998. That's around 12,000, 1,200 columns, rather, about 30,000 hours of radio. New York Times bestselling author, and I've been debating these issues for some 40 years. And every now and then, a young person will come up to me and say, you know, my dad used to make me listen to you while I was being driven to and from elementary school. And little by little, I began saying, Dad, can you cut on Larry Elder? So it's really flattering to hear that. Uh, Can I give you a little story? I I, um, have often asked what are some of the interesting things that happened on the campaign trail. This just happened yesterday. I was in um, uh, D.C. and getting ready to come back to L.A. So we're at the Reagan uh, National airport and I'm in the restroom. Now, my dad, as we may talk about in the next few minutes, uh, used to clean toilets when we grew up. My dad had two full-time jobs cleaning toilets at the Disco brand bread. And then he got another hookup at another bread company called Barbara Ann Bread, where he also cleaned toilets for almost 10 years. And so whenever I'm in a restroom and I see a janitor there, I always give the janitor a tip. Nobody else does that. I'm not mm-hmm. saying, saying it to mean anybody else. I'm just saying, I've just noticed nobody else does that. So I'm in the, uh, in the bathroom, the janitor there who happened to be black and he appears to be about 40 years old and he's sweeping up and it's a very crowded uh, bathroom. And I finished my, washing my hands and I whipped my wallet and I pulled out a $20 bill and I gave it to him. And I said, thank you. I started walking away and he went, wow, wow. You know where this is gonna go? It's gonna go right in the pocket of my daughter. And I said, well, that's why we have a daughter. And he said, wait a minute, you that, you that guy that running for president. 
I see you on Fox real loud. I'm a Republican. I think for myself. And I like <laughs> everything you stand for. By the way, I was listening to Steve Bannon podcast just the other day. He brought your name up. And it was a very positive. Mind if I take a selfie? <laughs> so we had best. a guy our picture. All this happened in the bathroom at the Reagan uh, National Airport. I have no <laughs> idea how the other people in the bathroom felt about it. But it was pretty <laughs> Quite an experience. <laughs> Hopefully they all have their backs to you. <laughs> um, I mean, well, that's, that's the best. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. And speaking of uh, your father, I'd, I'd like to start off by asking a question about sort of your upbringing and your background. You, you grew up in a bipartisan home, a mother who was a Democrat and a father who was a Republican. And I mean, your father is an impressive figure too, in and of himself, Staff Sergeant Randolph Elder, uh, back when FDR allowed all the races to come and serve in the military in 1941. Your dad was among that initial force of African-American Marines um, who enlisted Mm -hmm. at Camp Lejeune to fight for their country. And in so doing, he became a pioneer for racial equality. So you have an an amazing legacy of military service and uh, the, the long march to racial equality. And your father, in fact, uh, post posthumously um, won the Congressional Gold Medal. So I'd like to ask you just two questions. First of all, how did how did growing up in a bipartisan home shape or influence the development of your political views? And what was it like to to receive on your father's behalf that Congressional Gold Medal? I mean, it's the highest civilian honor. Yeah. And, and to, to to see him recognized as an important figure in uh, the, the history of our country and the pursuit of racial equality. Well, and not only did my dad get the uh, Congressional Gold Medal posthumously, but Dana Warbacher, Republican congressman out here, arranged for him to have his uh, medal delivered to him at a ceremony at Camp Pendleton. All these stress Marine colors guys were there. It's on YouTube. You can just Google Larry Elder, Staff Sergeant Larry Elder. You can watch the whole presentation. And it was amazing to all have all these people honor my father like that. Uh, it was extraordinary. And my dad, as you pointed out, he was a lifelong Republican. My mom was a lifelong Democrat. And oh, to be a fly on the wall during, <laughs> during dinner or during breakfast when we were able to have it together to hear them talk. And my mother had very strong views. My dad had very strong views. They argued them very passionately, but nobody called anybody a fascist. Nobody called anybody a Nazi. Nobody said, you only care about the rich, you don't care about the poor. They argued everything very, very uh, aggressively, but, uh, but civilly. And I don't know why we can't, we can't do that. Uh, and as I mentioned, my father uh, uh, cleaned toilets. My father never knew his biological father. My last name is Elder. That was the name of some man who was in his life the longest who was an alcoholic who physically would beat up his mom. And when my dad tried to stop it, he beat up my father. Uh, and his mom was very irresponsible. He was an only child and uh, she could neither read nor write. So my dad doesn't even know his birth date. He knows the year, but he doesn't know the day because she couldn't even write it down in the family Bible because of course he wasn't born in a hospital. Uh, and my dad came home at the age of 13 and he starts quarreling with my mom, with his mom's then boyfriend. And his mother sides with the boyfriend and throws my father out of the house. Mm-hmm. Never to return. A 13-year-old black boy, uh, Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow South at the beginning of the Great Depression. My dad said he picked the trash, he cleaned out barns. Ultimately, he became a Pullman porter on the trains. They were the largest private employer of blacks in those days. So this young man from the South was able to travel all around the country. And he came to this place called California and a city called Los Angeles. And my dad was blown away, Kelly. He could walk to the front door of a restaurant and get served and sit down and get served. And my dad always had packages of crackers and tin cans of tuna with him because in the South, never knew whether you'd be able to get a meal. So my dad made a mental note, maybe someday I'll relocate to California. Pearl Harbor, my dad joined the Marines. And I asked him why. And he said two reasons. They go where the action is. And I love the uniforms. So my dad was stationed on the island of Guam. Uh, and uh, you mentioned about my dad being a pioneer, Nikki. I gave a speech one time uh, at a Veterans Affairs, and I talked about my dad a little bit. And when the speech was over, this man comes up to me, he's about maybe 95 years old. Uh, and um, he says, I, I probably served on the island of Guam with your dad. I said, well, my dad was in charge of cooking, so my dad probably served you a meal. And he says, no, he wouldn't have because the military was segregated in those days. Mm-hmm. The black Marines were served by black Marines and the white Marines were served by white Marines. So I went home that day uh, my dad was in the back of the house. Mom, mom was in the front. 
And I said, Mom, when Dad was in the military and he was uh, in charge of cooking, for, cooking facilities, did he serve both black Marines and white Marines? She said, yes, both black and white Marines. So I went in the back room. I said, Dad, when you were in the Marines and you were cooking, were you serving both black Marines and white Marines? He said, no, no, just black Marines. So my mom didn't even know. Oh, I didn't even know. My dad never explained that. This man that I didn't even know came up to me and he said, no, I don't think so because of this, that, and the other. So my dad gets out of the Marines. Wait, Larry, let's take a short break. I want to hear the rest of your story. We'll be right back with Larry Elder in a minute. Stay tuned. We're back on stand with Larry Elder running for president of the United States. And we were just hearing a great story about Larry's dad, who was in the military. And finish off your story with us, Larry. We're waiting with bated breath as you're learning more about your dad than your mom knew. Right. And so um, my dad, when the war is over, he goes to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he met and married my mom to get him a job as a cook. My dad can look at a cake and tell you what's in it. And he goes to a restaurant and then he goes to another one and goes to another one. He's told the same thing all three times. We don't hire niggers. My dad goes to an unemployment office. The lady says, you went through the wrong door. My dad goes out to the hall, sees colored only, goes through that door to the very same lady who sent him out. She's wanted him to know what the rules were. So my dad came home to my mom and said, this is nonsense. I'm going to LA where I was before the war and I'm gonna get me a job as a cook and I'll send for you. So my dad comes out to LA, he walks around for uh, half a day and he's told at every single restaurant, you don't have any references. My dad said, I need references to make ham and eggs? He even offered to work for free to get a reference, a written reference, and nobody would do that. So they treated him the same way in LA as in Chattanooga, maybe a little more polite. Mm. He goes to the unemployment office, this time just one door. Lady says, I have nothing. My dad says, what time do you open? She says, nine. What time do you close? She says, five. My dad said, I'll be sitting in that chair until you can have something. My dad sat there for a whole day, came back the next day. She calls him up. She says, I have something. I don't know whether you're going to want it. My dad said, of course I'm going to want it. I'm starting a family. What is it? She says, a job cleaning toilets and the Visco brand brand. My dad did that for 10 years. Second full-time job, as I mentioned earlier, with another bread company. Uh, cooked for a family on the weekend because he wanted to make additional money because he wanted my mom to be a stay-at-home mom, which she was until the youngest of us was in middle school. And he went to night school to get his GED. And after getting that, he went back to night school to learn how to operate a small restaurant. Saves his nickels and dimes, age 47, starts a small restaurant uh, near downtown L.A. When my dad retires, he owns that restaurant, the property below it, wow. a little piece of property next door to it, plus a home that's still in our family. Not too shabby for an eighth grade dropout, Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow, when systemic racism was systemic racism. Right. And my Republican dad always told my brothers and me, Democrats want to give you something for nothing. When you try and get something for nothing, you almost always end up getting nothing for something. They used to drive my mom crazy. Huh. And he also told my brothers and me the following. Hard work wins. Get out of life what you put into it. Uh, you cannot control the outcome, Larry, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you moan or groan about what somebody did or said to you, go to the nearest mirror, look at it, and ask yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? And mm -hmm. finally, no matter how good you are, how hard you work, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen to you. How do you deal with those bad things? Tell your mother and me if we raised a man. And that's my philosophy. That's what drives me. That's what drives my my uh, my brothers. And that's why, I, frankly, uh, I have so little tolerance when I hear this stuff about systemic racism and how uh, the man is holding people back. Uh, this is the only majority white country that's ever voted, let alone reelected uh, a black president. You can go from nothing to something faster in America than you can in any, any other country in all, all of human history. As you and I are speaking, there are Haitians in, in Haiti lining up uh, for a shot at a lottery to come into America. Uh, yet many people are deluded into believing that they're held back by, by certain kinds of systems, when in fact, the formula to escape poverty, as uh, outlined by a left-wing think tank called the Brookings Institution, finish high school, make sure, by the way, you can graduate from one where you can read, writing, compute at grade level. That's why I support school choice. Don't have a kid before you're 20 years old. Get married first. Get a job. Keep a job. Don't quit until you get another one. And avoid the criminal justice system. If you do that, you will not be poor. If you don't do that, there's a really good chance you will be. That's the formula that we ought to be telling people, particularly so-called black leaders like Barack Obama, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Farrakhan, when in fact they're doing the opposite, telling black kids it's being held back because of racism. And it does a great deal of damage to race relations. Plus, it is not true. And you're undermining uh, the enthusiasm that people ought to have uh, towards attacking life and doing the kinds of things you need in order to get ahead. And your your personal story shows us that 
you know, going from what you told us about your dad of facing real systemic racism to his son running for president and yeah. and being the front runner for the Republican Party for governor in the recall against Gavin Newsom. What did you learn in that incredibly difficult battle? The whole nation had its eyes on you. They sure did. Uh, in the, in the uh, hotel room the night of the election, Kelly, we had four TV sets. One was on CNN, one was on Fox, one was on MSNBC, and one was on local ABC News. And several times, all four of the channels uh, was talking about the race. That's kind of out of body. You're sitting in your hotel room <laughs> and, you're, and you're, you just uh, got off the campaign trail and they're counting the results and all four of the major, three of the major uh, cable networks are, are talking about you, plus the local news. It's out of body. What I learned is it's almost impossible to win as a Republican uh, in California. One has not won in almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. The reason I did the recall is because I figured if the ball carried them the right way, I could conceivably squeak in with a little at 25 percent of the total votes cast, giving me about a year and a half before he has to run for I have to run for another four four years. And between then uh, and the next time I have to run, I could explain to people that I don't have a horn, I don't have a tail, and maybe just maybe their lives might have improved a little bit, and then I can get a fresh four. But no one's won in California in almost 20 years as a Republican. We're outnumbered three to one registered uh, uh, Republicans versus those who are registered as something else. Uh, and even in L.A., where I live, we just had a mayoral race and the Republican Republican ish opponent. He was Republican all his life. And then he, he turned to be independent. And then right before he decided to run for mayor, uh, he switched his party to a Democrat, knowing full well that people in L.A. don't pull their lever for somebody with an R at the back of a name. So he outspent the victorious Democrat uh, 10 to 1, and he still lost by almost nine points. It's wow. almost impossible to win nationwide in, in California. Uh, Democrats dominate the state, which is why I wrote that book, um, uh, right. As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save the Nation, because it shows you what happens when you have a one-party state like California. Two-thirds majority of Democrats in the Senate, two-thirds majority of Democrats in the Assembly, and they pass every job-killing brain-dead bill after another, after another, after another, to the point now for the first time in California's 170-year history, people are leaving. The average price of a home in California is 175% above average. Uh, the Nash, the uh, test scores are, are near the bottom of all 50 states. Uh, are, we have a, a serious homeless problem, a serious illegal immigration problem, a serious crime problem, all because of the policies that people in California have consistently voted for. I was asked during, during the race whether or not I support term limits. I said, yeah, for voters. <laughs> <laughs> After you vote two or three times, uh, de Democrats, you lose your right to vote. I was being facetious, but there was a headline, Elder wants voters termed out. I <laughs> you know, that race was obviously intense, and it highlighted something that we see way too often, Larry, where it seems like people of color who are conservatives or Republicans and who develop some measure of social or political influence, and yours is broad and deep, they often become targets of some of the most revolting threats and attacks, which is really ironic because supposedly we, we want we want people of color to think for themselves. And we so 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 the idea of just going after a person of color just because they happen not to follow the say Democrat Party line is just really sad. But during your run for government, L.A. Times columnist made an absolutely horrendous comment about you. It's even hard to for me to say right now, but she quote called you quote the black face of white supremacy, yeah. and that was shocking in and of itself. What was even more shocking to me was I don't remember seeing a uh, a broad, widespread condemnation of her comments in the national media, and I think that's symptomatic of a problem that uh, is pervasive, where you have a lot of Black Americans, like the the janitor you mentioned at, at the airport, who mm -hmm actually agree with your views and, and and convictions, but are afraid to take a stand publicly for them for fear of the back, backlash. What would you say to some of those those folks uh, to encourage them to to get out into the public square and not to be afraid of taking a stand for what they believe like you have? Mickey, I've been called an Uncle Tom, a bootlicking Uncle Tom, a bug-eyed, foot-shuffling bootlicking Uncle Tom, uh, the Antichrist, uh, I've been called that name that you really want to hurt somebody's feelings. I've been called Republican even before I was a Republican. Uh, but the thing that I fear most being called is you're mistaken. You're wrong. 
I rarely hear that. I hear name calling. When I talk about the fact that the police kill more unarmed whites every year than they kill unarmed blacks, uh, very few people tell me that I am wrong. They often tell me I am defending the white man, whatever that means. Uh, but what I really fear is misstating something, misstating data. Uh, I don't worry, worry too much about the shrill attacks because uh, it shows you that you're completely and totally out of ammo. And what's ironic, uh, Nikki, about, about this and about the question you're asking me is we, we claim that we want a diverse, uh, diverse country. I remember one time Brian Gumbel was making some derogatory comment about Republicans. He doesn't like the Winter Olympics, or he didn't at the time. And he said something to the effect of the Winter Olympics reminds me of a Republican convention, meaning that there are very few black participants. So when there is a black participant in the Republican, he then is maligned as a black face of white supremacy. So what do you want? You want black Republicans or do you not want black Republicans? Which is it? You can't win. Uh, and um, Joe, I just the other day uh, went on the show called Charlemagne the God. Charlemagne the God is a very popular radio host out of New York. He's got about 4 million followers on Instagram, uh, 2 million on Twitter, a million followers on Facebook. He's got a real, real impact. And he's what I call a black victocrat, somebody who believes that that uh, black people are, remain oppressed uh, and the uh, disparities that we can complain about have to do with racism as opposed to uh, cultural kinds of things and bad choices people are making. So I was on his show uh, and, um, uh, you know, it was three against one and one demeaning comment after another, after another, after another. Um, and uh, most of the time. I would make a point and the response would be some sort of emotional dig as opposed to here's why, here's where you were wrong. Uh, and you know, I, I tried to explain to him that this business about referring to America as being systemically racist, not only is it wrong, not only is it uh, undermining people's initiative, it's getting people killed. It's mm -hmm. called the Ferguson effect or the George Floyd effect. And that's a phenomenon of cops pulling back all over the country as they have in the last few years because of being attacked of having been systemically racist. Even the Democrat mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, a couple of years ago, referred to the Chicago PD as, quote, having gone fetal, close quote, mm -hmm. following the high profile shooting of a black person, meaning they weren't doing their jobs. Let and me so cut, last... Sorry, let me stop you right there, Larry. We'll come right back with uh, Larry Elder running for president. Stand by and we'll pick up when we come back. Africa New Day with mission is actually to create leaders change a culture and transform a nation. We believe that this is an area where God wants us to make a difference. You know, he has called us the light of the world. Well, where does the light shine? Where there is darkness. As you pray with us, as you contribute to our efforts, we believe that together we can make a difference. We're back with Larry Elder. Larry, you were just finishing up talking to us about your your thoughts on all things with Black America yeah. and how there's a double standard for people who think for themselves and choose to be Republican. Right. And I was talking about the rather brutal hour and six minutes I had with Charlemagne the God out of New York. So I'm talking about some of the things going on in, in, the, uh, in the Black community. And he said to me, what have white people done wrong? And I said, Charlemagne, what are we talking about here? 70% of black kids enter the world without a father in the home married to the mother. A young black man aged 10 to 43 is 13 times more likely to be murdered than a young white man, same demo. The top cause of preventable death for a black person 19 years and under is homicide, almost always at the hands of another 19 year old and younger. Whereas the top reason for death for a white man 13, 19 and under, is accidents, like car accidents or drug accidents. Homicide is the fifth largest uh, reason for the death of people who are white, 19 and under. 5% of white people who are dead at 19 and under are, are, are dead because of homicide, where 35% of black, pe black young people, 19 and under, are dead because of homicide. We have a 50% urban dropout rate in many of our urban schools. We have schools like Milwaukee, where 13 public high schools Zero percent of the kids can do math at grade level. Another half a dozen, only one percent can. That's half of all the public high schools in Baltimore, all located in the inner city, were zero percent. Now, if you have those kinds of conditions within the white community, I'll talk to you about that. Right now, we're talking about what's going on in the black community. And rather than say, let's deal with this, you're mad at me for not uh, outing, uh, white, uh, outing the bad things that white people have done. 
It doesn't really make any sense. It's not getting us anywhere. It's not advancing the ball. Those are really good points. Speaking of advancing the ball, you're running for president. We want to give you as much time as possible to talk to us about your presidential campaign. We want to start off with two questions. What would you tell our audience distinguishes you from the crowd of candidates who are running in this presidential primary? And if elected president, what would some of your main policy priorities be, whether foreign or domestic? Well, what distinguishes me is that I am a America first mega guy. We have an America first mega guy running and he's got a pretty commanding lead. Why then uh, are you running? I'm running because I want to put front and center some issues that the others are not talking about very much, if at all. One of them we already talked about, and that's the epidemic of fatherlessness. As I mentioned, 70 percent of black kids into the world without a father in the home married to the mother, up from 25 percent back in 1965. Now, 25% of white kids do. And the numbers are clear. If you're raised without a dad, you're five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. And we don't talk enough about this. All these kids need mentors. I liken it to Alcoholics Anonymous, where every single recovering alcoholic has a mentor. And I'm urging all the baby boomers my generation who have retired or about ready to retire, they're still vigorous, they raise kids, they nurture grandkids, to get involved and step up and become sponsors. And if you can't do that or won't do that, how about lending resources? Um, we're spending a lot of money at the federal level on programs to reduce poverty. They don't work. The programs that do work are the ones that are in neighborhoods, ones done by churches. You ought to be able to take your tax dollars to have them directed towards programs going to Washington, D.C., and redirect those, pro those monies for programs in your own neighborhoods. And that's what I'm going to be urging when I become president. The other big thing I want to talk about is the lie. We talked, about, talked on this a little bit earlier that America remains systemically racist. As I said earlier, uh, not only is it getting people killed, it's the Ferguson effect or the George Floyd effect, uh, but it's also driving nonsense like reparations, which in my opinion is the extraction of money from people who are never slave owners to be given to people who are never slaves. It's driving stuff like race-based preferences, which on the paper sounds wonderful. Uh, in reality, what it does is cause a mismatch between students and campus. And as a result, the so-called beneficiaries of race-based preferences are often dropping out uh, when they would have finished fine at a lesser competitive school. And then they drop out, they end up with a lot of student debt, they end up being angry. Uh, all of it is pointless. And the other way it's getting people killed is take a look at the George Floyd or the Black Lives Matter riots of May of 2020. They were four months long, 35 people killed, largest riots uh, and protests in American history, 2,000 police officers were wounded, $2 billion of property damage, maybe another billion dollars or two of uninsured property damage, uh, many of these uh, properties were mom and pop restaurants or businesses owned by the very black and brown people that people claim that they care about. But more importantly, there is zero evidence, however you feel about the treatment of George Floyd, and I thought that the, uh, the verdict was a just verdict, however you feel about the treatment of George Floyd, there is zero evidence he was mistreated because of his race. The lead prosecutor, a black man, uh, took pains in his opening statement to say the police in general were not on trial. The Minneapolis PD in general was not on trial. This individual was on trial. And Derek Chauvin was never even charged with a hate crime. But people are in the streets because of an assumption that what happened to George Floyd had to do with its race. This is, this is the damage the media does uh, and the Democrats do in corrupting the way people see an issue. For example, there's a website called policemag.com. And they discussed a poll where people who self-describe as very liberal, and I dare say of the millions of people who participated in these protests in 200 different cities, probably most of them would probably self-identify as very liberal. They asked very liberal people, how many unarmed black men did the police kill in 2019? And by the way, unarmed does not mean not dangerous. Michael Brown was unarmed, but his DNA was found on the officer's gun. But put that aside. How many unarmed black men did the police kill in 2019? 50% of the self-described very liberal people thought the police killed 1,000. Of those who self-described as just liberal, 39% thought the police killed 1,000. The police killed, according to the Washington Post database, 12. Now, that's the gap between what people think is going on and what really is going on. And as I said earlier, the police kill more unarmed white men every year than unarmed black men, but most people could not name an unarmed white person. You can go on YouTube and type in the word Kelly Thomas, Fullerton Police. It's a white man, homeless, mentally ill, and he was beaten by the police over a longer period than was uh, George Floyd held. Uh, and there's another one called Tony Tempa, T-I-M like Mary, P like Paul A, Dallas, Texas, a few years ago. Another uh, mentally ill guy held down, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, kind of the same scenario as George Floyd. 
uh, and you can't even name his, his name because it's not the right, right race. Nobody cares. Uh, a few months ago, we had this incident on the subway in New York where that uh, uh, retired Marine, Daniel Penny, put a chokehold on Jordan Neely. Uh, protests on the subway, they got in the, in the train tracks and blocked the, uh, uh, the subways, and ultimately Alvin Bragg brought charges against uh, against the Marine. Zero evidence that he would not have acted had the uh, Jordan Neely been white. We'll put that aside. Three weeks earlier, I kid you not, Tulsa, Oklahoma, a homeless uh, black man walks up to a white man uh, who has his back turned to him, picks up a gun, shoots him in the back of the head, kills him execution style, goes to another part of Tulsa, walks up to another white man, pulls out a gun, shoots him, kills him execution style, admits he did it because they were white. Now, he got caught. But if it had been the other way around, we know his name, we know the victims, we know their names, but because they weren't the right race, nobody cares. And as a result, people get the false impression this happens all the time, when in fact, most homicides are same race homicides. Most black people are killed by other black people. Most white people are killed by other white people. By the way, every single year, there are some interracial black, white, or white, black homicides, about 750 each year. 500 uh, uh, whites are killed by blacks, even though blacks are just 13% of the population. 250 blacks are killed by whites, even though whites are 60% of the population. So when there are interracial homicides, it is more likely to be a black perp than a, uh, than a, uh, a white perp. And if you look at violent crime between blacks and whites, uh, other than homicide, by that I'm talking about attempted homicide, uh, uh, manslaughter, uh, rape, assault with a weapon, they're roughly between 500 and 600 uh, such acts every single year. In 90% of the case, it's a black perp uh, and a white victim, only 10% the other way around. And these are the kinds of things I was trying to tell Charlemagne the God and his, his head almost exploded. So it just isn't true. Black people are not being uh, pursued by the police. They're not being pursued by white supremacists, even though Joe Biden uh, the other day uh, at Howard gave a commencement exercise and said the number one threat to the homeland was white supremacy. Really? 25 uh, people were killed who were defined as extremists according to the Anti-Defamation League last year, whereas in 2020, 11,000 black homicide victims, 90% of them killed by other blacks. I don't think very many of them, if at all, were killed by white supremacists. So it's a lie that's getting people angry. And the reason Democrats do it is because they want black people to, to uh, go in there and pull that lever for the Democratic Party because the party has successfully characterized itself as a party of social justice and equity, whatever that means. And they successfully uh, characterized the Republican Party as a party of bigots and racists. I don't know how they pulled it off, given the, the, the rather sordid history of the Democratic Party, the party of slavery, party of the Confederacy, party of Jim Crow, the party of Dred Scott, the party of the KKK, the party that voted as a smaller percentage for the Civil Rights Act of 64 than did Democrats, the party that uh, is a party of the welfare state that destroyed the family, and is a party that opposes school choice. But the, somehow they've convinced black people that they're that they're the white horse and these people over here are wearing the black hat and, and sitting on top of the black horse. It's amazing. It's amazing yeah. what, we, what we're seeing. And, you know, having lived abroad my entire uh, childhood, I, this is just from personal experience, not data, but I can, I can tell you one of the things that surprised me when I came here as a, as a young man for college was, wow, America really treats people of all races so much more equally and respectfully than anywhere else I'd ever been. I'd experienced far more racism, racism in, in Africa, South America, and Europe, all places where I grew up, um, yeah. than I ever have here. That's not to say we don't have work to do, but everything right. that you've been saying, Larry, is just common sense. It's, it's data. And until we, as a, a Black community and as a country, can, can just embrace that and say, okay, the data speaks for itself, We've got to change how we're thinking about these issues. We're we're stuck, and so I really appreciate the fact that your 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 voice is out there, bringing these issues to light and speaking about these things really boldly. You're a prolific and engaging author. Um, in fact, you've written that great new book, "As Goes California: My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and then and Save the Nation." I can't wait to read it and encourage our listeners to to go out and buy it too. But following along those lines, let's like. Let's take your, your, your writer's pen. Uh, oh, we're out of time, so we'll have to save it for <laughs> some other time. But uh, Larry, great to have you on the show. Uh, to, our, to our listeners, if you want to support Larry, be sure to go to LarryElder.com. That's LarryElder.com. 
Larry, thank you so much for being on the show. We encourage you to keep standing firm and standing fast. And the same to our listeners. Take care, everybody. This is Stan. Kelly and Nikki, thank you so much for having me. And you know where to find it. Thanks, Larry. You're always welcome here. We wish you the best, Larry. We're back on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca, just having ended a great interview with Larry Elder, former candidate for governor of California, now running for president of the United States. I thought that was a fascinating interview. You know, it really was. Um, as I'm thinking about it, one of the powerful things that, uh, that Larry brought to the table was his personal story and data, facts to support what his views are and what his uh, approach is to how we can improve the situation for uh, the black community in, in this country. And I think it was, it was, I mean, he just went like fact <laughs> after fact and data point after data point. And, and it's so important because at the end of the day, in order to solve a problem, you have to properly diagnose it. Hmm. And it's, it's just not helpful to say, oh, well, systemic racism. And just that, that, those are the two words you throw at every issue, every problem as it relates to uh, people of color. That's not helping them. That's not helping us. I'm one of them. What's helpful is, what does the data say? How do, you know, and taking from that data, what can we then do? What kind of solutions can we then put together for the problem? And that's what Larry did. He said, look, 70% of, you know, black kids are growing up uh, fatherless. And we know that that's a big contributor to um, poverty in the future, and they're more likely to engage in crime, uh, whether you're black, white, or any race, if you grow up without a father. Uh, it's just that we were seeing an epidemic of this in, in, in the black community. And so he had the data, and he had a solution for it. Mm -hmm. We've got to start working at a community level, community levels across the country, to encourage uh, and help black families, poor families, um, that are struggling, say, in this kind of an area, uh, to uh, to fight back against the kinds of things that are keeping them in the place that, that they're in. Um, I just thought that was very powerful. And I love the fact that it was a community solution. Mm -hmm. It wasn't D.C. has to fix this. Right. Because what our politicians will tell us, no offense, sweetheart, but... <laughs> right. Hey, I never elected them out of politician. Right. There you go. But, but, you know, what politicians will tell us is, they, they're the ones who have the solutions and are the solution. And really, I think more often than not, our communities across the country are the ones that have the solutions and are the solution. And that's what I've heard Larry saying is like, we need, that's why we need to redirect all these taxpayer dollars to community organizations mm -hmm. that are actually doing the work on the ground and know what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's, I don't know what the word is, like a solutioner, but I like your... A solutionary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The connection you made that he he gave the data, but he didn't just stop there. He then put it into a meaningful solution that could actually deliver results and outcomes, which is what makes for good policy. It's rooted in something besides just I feel eology. I feel, therefore, um, it's data-based. But the other thing I really noticed is that when we said, hey, the floor is yours. What are you focusing on as president? And he could have said anything. The stuff he chose to focus on is actually born out of his own story and his experience, which I thought is fascinating because it's almost like saying it worked. If it worked for me, then it'll work for the rest of America, which is true. When you have someone whose family came from experiencing incredible racism, I don't think anybody could challenge that and deep poverty and really had to struggle to then live the American dream. They experience what a lot of people would say doesn't exist anymore. I don't believe that. I know Larry wouldn't believe that. Your family has lived the American dream and so has mine. But he would say, we could make that a reality for everybody by putting these things in step, in place. And one of them is family, family values, like you're saying, um, the solutions for, I would say, parentlessness, whether that's fathers or mothers. We sure are seeing a lot of single fathers these days. Um, putting solutions in place for education. You know, like he said, it, sometimes people are going all through all the grades of school and they're still graduating 
um, without literacy or math proficiency. We need to solve that. Um, what he would say in the solutions coming through the community rather than from top-down capital-based solutions. Um, Community-oriented solutions, education solutions, family solutions, that's what worked in Larry's home and community to create a whole different outcome and reality. And so then if we could just duplicate, replicate that across America, wouldn't that work for every home and every community? And I think logically the answer is yes, is we've talked about the family unit is the base economic unit in America. It's the base morality unit. It's the base support unit. It's right. the base everything. Stronger families make a stronger America. So I think it's interesting to hear a presidential candidate, not just local candidates or school board candidates, focus on these grassroots issues and really a refreshing perspective from somebody who's been at all levels. The other thing I thought was interesting is right at the end, he started to talk about the communication part. When he was kind of comparing and contrasting across the aisle, I thought it was great that he didn't beat up other people in his party, but instead contrasted himself with who the opponent would be on the other end of the ticket to say, um, it's interesting that they would say that they're the party who does this when actually they did this, but they communicate something different. I think something that would set Larry Elder apart is his vast experience in communication. To be able, you know, we didn't have to ask a lot of questions, he just talked, but to be able to communicate effectively, um, this is the history of the experience of the Republican Party. This is what we stand for. We don't need to sling mud and get into name calling because we need to talk about the ideas and the policies and the solutioning rather than get into hostilities. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. That that does make his his voice, part of what makes his voice unique among the other right. candidates uh, vying for the Republican nomination. And to your point as well, the, you know, one being the, his ability to communicate so effectively and so well, but also, like you said, the focus on community action, community grassroots, working together to resolve our, our, our country's issues. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I haven't heard that much uh, from, from many of the candidates uh, and I've been listening pretty closely. And so I think that's, that's a unique thing that we need to hear more about. And as a country, not just as a party, as a country, think more about and talk more about, not in a combative way, but really in, an, in a way where we can really engage in some robust dialogue and debate on to come to a good mm. solution, right? Because ultimately we want every American no matter what race, no matter what gender, no matter what sexual orientation, we want Americans, all Americans to thrive right. and to be able to experience the fruits of you know, the American dream. And that seems to be what his focus is. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's interesting, as I think with all kinds of solutions for major problems, oftentimes the simpler ones are the most effective, <laughs> right? Yeah. You'll have 5,000 page, pages of legislation in D.C., right, to, to fix a problem, uh, and what Larry was proposing doesn't amount to anywhere near that, but will be a lot more effective. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like dads. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Kids need dads. Kids, kids need dads. Need, kids need moms. Yeah. Kids need to finish high school. Kids need to be able to read, write, and, you know, do arithmetic, right? We That should be the focus of our educational institutions, K through 12, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Well, when right. it comes to our audience and the whole question of how do you take a stand and, and what do you stand for, some of the things that I heard him say that I thought were good takeaways are um, know your data, like, know, know the facts, know, know what's true, and have some of that in your back pocket. And it was almost like hearing him say, because once you see, you can't unsee. Once you know the truth, then you have to do something about it. And something else I heard him say kind of in between the lines is um, you have to take a stand for the things that move you. You don't see him out there taking stands for things that were un that he was unaffected by. You see him taking a stand in the things that link directly to his personal story. I didn't know how he'd answer those questions in the beginning about his own mm -hmm. personal story, but he has a fascinating story and the things he's doing now later in life, tied directly to experiences that his parents had and that he had. 
Um, so knowing your data and then the things that move you that you see and you're kind of shocked by doing something about it and then actions speak louder than words. Um, so, so doing something locally and then don't just talk it, live it. You know, he's, he's walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Well, you make the great, you've made this point, I think, really effectively that we're all products of our, our story, mm -hmm. you know, our, of our, of our history. And uh, he's building on a legacy that his parents yeah. left for him. And it's a powerful legacy, not just in terms of what his father did, but remembering what he said at the beginning about his mother being a Democrat, right. his father being a Republican, and them having very robust and it seems like passionate debates and dialogues at, you know, at the kitchen table about their different views. And obviously having a very uh, long and, and a wonderful marriage. That's what we want for our country, right? We want, to, right. we want that to be able to have different views, to passionately uh, be able to debate those different views and find areas of, of agreement. And where we don't, not resort to demonization and division. Uh, and so I thought, again, his, his mother and father's story is one of is is powerful in the sense that it it's diversity in and of itself true that diversity of thought and perspective but unity with it within it mm -hmm. and that's america yeah that's who we are that's right it was a fascinating conversation so that's a wrap for us all of you who are listening you can find this episode on our website standshow.org or follow us on youtube at the stand show of course, we're posting on social media under Kelly for Alaska. If you are one of our faithful listeners, we call you the standouts. So thank you for being a standout with us. And we can't wait to see you on the next episode of Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Until then, stand firm, stand strong, and have a wonderful week.